While there are many areas of the province where snow is hard to come by, and while it is disappointing if you are a cross-country skier, you just want to play in the snow, the problems, of course, go so much deeper and are much more serious for people who are worried about drought and its impacts. Alberta is on high alert. The drought plague province is bracing for even worse conditions. The Alberta government is pushing water sharing and cities will restrict usage. And then for Saskatchewan, as a direct neighbour, what does that mean for us? Today we'll be speaking with someone who keeps a very close eye on water levels in this province and right across the prairies. And we also want to hear from you. Are you worried about the drought? What are you seeing where you live? You can call us 1-800-716-2221 or email bluesky at cbc.ca. John Pomeroy is a professor at the University of Saskatchewan and a Canada Research Chair in Water Resources and Climate Change. He is in Calgary today, but he's generously agreed to take some time for us. John, welcome to Blue Sky. Oh, good afternoon, and thank you for having me on. Yeah, so I'm no expert, and I look outside and I feel very concerned. You are in Alberta right now. What are you seeing outside that concerns you? Um. Yes, uh, well, Calgary had no snow at all on the weekend, and they, they just had a little snowstorm, and they've got us what I would call skiff of snow. It's just enough to cover the ground. But even uh, worse is up in the mountains. Uh, the, the Canadian Rockies are providing about 80% of the water for the Saskatchewan River system. And uh, the snowpacks there are from half to two-thirds of where they should be at this time of year. And... Uh, you know, as we're moving towards spring, that's starting to become a worry. Will we have enough uh, snow melt to uh, fill our rivers and reservoirs again in Saskatchewan? Yeah, that is the question. So what are your colleagues saying? How concerned are your colleagues in Alberta right now? Uh, they are, uh, uh, the Alberta government's in a, um, taking it very, very seriously. They have a, a drought uh, response team, and they, uh, but also the uh, hydrologists and the provincial government are, are looking at the uh, ways that they might allocate water uh, with uh, insufficient water to uh, provide for all the needs. And of course, Alberta has very large irrigation areas around Calgary and further south to Lethbridge, as, uh, as well as large cities. Uh, Calgary is 1.6 million, so there's a, there's a lot of water demands in Alberta itself, but also the obligation to pass on one half of the natural flows to Saskatchewan under the uh, master agreement uh, uh, as part of the Prairie Province Water Apportionment uh, System, uh, which goes back to 1969. Okay, so we obviously have a lot to talk about uh, on Blue Sky today. I, I just want you to elaborate on what you mean by irrigation areas around Calgary. We've got somebody um, waiting to take uh, for, with a question for you, but I just want to better understand what we're referring to when we when you say irrigation areas. Okay. Um, Yes, yeah, so over the last century, uh, Alberta developed vast areas for irrigated agriculture. Uh, in this case, uh, these were in semi-arid zones where uh, 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 getting a, a regular good crop off was, was not uh, a reliable thing, and uh, also in well-drained soils. And so the, uh, these uh, irrigation systems withdraw water from the rivers, not from groundwater, but from the rivers, uh, the bow and the old man principally, um, they're sometimes stored in reservoirs for very short periods of time and then applied to the fields generally as spray irrigation. And, um, and, and of course, they developed uh, a very intense economy around that, a food economy around this uh, from uh, uh, more feed for livestock to uh, uh, finishing plants and meat packing plants and, uh, and everything else around it, as well as uh, famous tabor corn and potatoes and and many other things as you get in the far south of the province where it has a hotter summers. So that's uh, so that consumes about 80% of the water in the South Saskatchewan River in Alberta uh, is really going into that, uh, or 80% of the water that's withdrawn uh, goes into irrigation. It's just about 20% of it, what's withdrawn goes to the cities and doesn't come back. But the uh, in, in wet years, uh, that's still a fairly small proportion of the natural flows in the South Saskatchewan River system. Um, in uh, drier years, it becomes higher. And of course, it cannot exceed 50% over the uh, rivers that cross from Alberta into Saskatchewan under the Prairie Provinces Agreement. So that's the, uh, uh, Alberta's looking at this for next year. Uh, they're talking to the irrigators and to the cities 
and saying that you may need to cut back your water use from what you're allocated under the provincial regime here, the first in time, first in right, with existing water licenses, and uh, and they they're working to do this on a uh, negotiated uh, basis, which is uh, an interesting uh, interesting approach, and it's the first time it's really been attempted at this scale in Alberta. And there there are also water withdrawals for oil and gas, for fracking, uh, other things uh, for industry, and all this has to be worked out. Okay, so just one quick question before we get to our caller. How realistic is it to get parties like that to cut back on, on their water? When you're talking about providing water um, for all sorts of things, everything from tapered corn to meatpacking plants, um, what, what would that take to, for those parties to, to cut back on their water, their water use? Yes, it, uh, my understanding, I, I'm not a legal expert, but my understanding the province doesn't have the legal authority to compel people to cut back if they have a license. Um, and maybe they can override it if they declare a state of emergency. But uh, something not something almost as bad occurred in 2001 in the drought of that time. And uh, that was done by agreement, uh, one, one-on-one agreements with the various irrigating farmers uh, to uh, voluntarily reduce their water intakes uh, for irrigation, which means reducing their yields. So this is a big deal. Um, and they did it. Uh, they, uh, the community spirit and the uh, feeling of cooperation is very strong amongst those producers. And uh, they reduced the uh, water withdrawals such that the Prairie Province's water apportionment agreement uh, terms were met and uh, other water uses for the communities and uh, ecosystem uh, were also met. So hmm. that was good. And uh, we'll see what happens this time. Though. Yeah, I guess. Okay, well, let's bring Orly into the conversation. She is on the line in Regina. Orly, hello. Hello. Thank you so much for creating this conversation. So I just want to start with thank you to Dr. John Pomeroy um, and to other scientists like Helen Balsh or Peter Levitt and Carrie Finley um, from the U of R. A nice bank of science-based knowledge that we really need to to move forward. So this, this fall, I went to Agribition. And Leah Clark from Water Security mentioned that uh, irrigation was a new success story for Saskatchewan. And they were really quite excited in, in investing in this. But Dr. John Palmer, my question for you is, if you were a farmer, would you be going to the bank and asking for a great deal of money to start irrigating out of the South Saskatchewan? Okay. Well, it's a hypothetical, and I'm not a farmer, so um, you know, that depends on personal circumstances and all the rest. Uh, certainly the farmers who uh, irrigated in southern Alberta and the ones who have irrigated around the Lake Deep Baker area right now uh, generally have made economic successes of it. You, you need a number of things in place. Uh, of course, you need the irrigation infrastructure. You need the ditches or the pipelines to get the waters to the farms. Uh, you need the markets for the crops and the uh, and the equipment to irrigate with, and uh, and so the uh, these are substantial investments, and uh, and also uh, I, th- I think you need that uh, that community support, uh, uh, community practice to find out what the best practices are in, in the region and for a particular year, and to uh, work together on that, and so that's a it's a big shift from dryland farming to irrigated farming. Okay. John, I appreciate that answer. And Orly, thank you for calling. Thank you. Let's go to Clint, who lives near the uh, Pipestone Creek in the Moose Mountain, in, in the Moose Mountains area in, in the southeast. So hello, Clint. Hey, John. How are you doing? Oh, very good. Um, thank you. I appreciate, I appreciate what you're doing, and and I wish you could get more uptake from our provincial government on your recommendations and the work you guys are doing at the Global Water Futures. But that being said, um, I have a couple of questions. But if you were concerned about drought and floods, would you do everything in your power to try and remove as much um, surface water and water table water from your area as possible? And would you try and connect as much surface area as you can uh, to your local rivers and creeks. Um, currently, we're going to spend billions of dollars to 
apparently just pay for an irrigation system for people out by Lake Diefenbaker. So I'm not sure they've got to go and borrow a lot of money because no one's mentioned um, paying for irrigation rights or annual um, payments for maintenance. But that being said, um, we're trying to um, convert parkland, which is a good environment, to dry land prairie. Um, by our government policies here. We're even paying producers to drain wetlands now and to channel clear our creeks. And in the West, we're going to spend billions of dollars trying to make dry land prairie behave like parkland. Uh, <laughs> any thoughts? Well, the, um, what, what this is, is is water management in various forms. And um, certainly, it, uh, when one looks at irrigated agriculture, it makes no sense to irrigate in humid areas uh, that have adequate moisture. Um, and in fact, you want to do it on well-drained, droughty soils that, uh, that typically would struggle in dryland farming situations. Uh, that's where it's excelled um, in the deserts around the world and semi arid regions. And so certainly, uh, southwestern Saskatchewan, the Palliser Triangle region, qualifies as a semi arid region. In that in that standpoint, uh, the um, and and it's a very different thing you you mentioned otherwise in terms of uh, drainage in the east where precipitation is higher and uh, ponding and, and uh, on fields is and, uh, uh, river basins is has been uh, more normal and uh, certainly there's a vast transformation that's been occurring in through the parkland zone of Saskatchewan uh, through the east and the north. Uh, with uh, the drainage or infilling of, uh, of natural ponds, depressions, which often form wetlands or sloughs. And that has uh, fundamentally changed the hydrology of that region as well. So we're doing these two things at the same time. And uh, but the other big uh, uh, shift that's going on is the climate is shifting and changing. And, um, and so we're, uh, we're doing these things generally in response to the uh, climate and the water that we've seen in the recent past. Um, yet we will be managing them in the future, which will have a, a rather different climate. So there are uncertainties with this, and uh, this is why I hope science can help in uh, providing advice uh, to governments, to, to producers, to uh, uh, basin, basin groups and, and uh, conservatories and others about how to, um, how to best manage these for various purposes. The, um, and, and certainly, the, uh, for instance, the, you know from the natural wetlands, uh, these are the places where groundwater recharge occurs. Uh, they evaporate uh, in dry years into the atmosphere and uh, help form uh, more rainfall. So there are some benefits that way. And of course, tremendous benefits for birds and wildlife in there. Um, and they hold back uh, excess water. So uh, they hold back flood waters to some degree and they hold back nutrients which run off uh, fields and excess nutrients can be a uh, very bad business when they end up in lakes and uh, uh, downstream where they can feed harmful algae blooms. Um, so so there, there are benefits to this, but also um, when you're uh, when you're farming and uh, you've got to move around them and all that, there are uh, uh, certainly costs associated with this as well. And that's how some of the best soils are in these areas. And the larger and larger equipment uh, finds it uh, more difficult to maneuver around them. And so the, uh, these are the challenges that, are, uh, that we see in that uh, parkland zone. And uh, we still need to retain the hydrological functioning and the ecological functioning of some of these wetlands and, um, and, the, uh, and then uh, have that uh, standing to some degree against the, uh, the economic drive to uh, produce on all soils all the time. Hmm. And, uh, so I, I'm, I'm hopeful that uh, water management in the future finds the right balance for this. I appreciate you bringing that up, Clint. And John, thank you for that answer. Clint was joining us from the southeast part of the province. And we've got now Barry Carrier on the line, who's called in from Cumberland House. And so, Barry, hello to you. Hey, good morning. How are you? I'm How well, you? thanks. Yeah, so your de- your community declared a state of emergency last year because of low reservoir levels. Uh, what what are you what 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 is the situation right now? What 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 concerns do you have? Well, I guess yeah, uh, you know the concerns have been there for the last fifty years. You know, for us, you know, when you have three dams 
on the Saskatchewan River, you know, it's been um, it's been happening with it, with us for for that many years. And you know, growing up as a kid, you know, watching the, the river river system, and uh, you know, once you start plugging up the river, you know, everything is going to come to a, you know a, a disaster at the end of the day. And now today we're faced with uh, you know with this state of emergency that. Uh, that we had to call our village. You know, there there's two there, the, the reservation and the, the village, and um, they call that state of emergency with you know with the slow water. And uh, so there's a lot of impacts. You know, I you know for us it's been there, you know, for the last 50 years, like I said, you know, and um, you watch everything from you know from the high waters and then the spring floods, the summer floods. You know, this year we didn't have the last couple of years we haven't had maybe just one flood a year, you know, and uh, so right there, it tells you, you know, there's no snow in the, in the Rocky the Rocky Mountains, mm-hmm. you know, and but we did have some snow, you know, a few years back, but it's a light snow, and, you know, the one that doesn't, uh, you know, have the, the water, you know, so so we're, we're, we've been in trouble for a long time, and uh, for me, I uh, I, uh, I watched our, our system, you know, coming to an end, you know, our Saskatchewan River, and, uh, you know, like, it's been studied, you know, from a guy from Nebraska and a local guy. He's passed on now, and uh, you know they've been at it for 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 the last 30 years, you know, and um, and they've told us what was going to come at the end of the day, and uh, and that's what we're impacted with today. And still today, I don't know the answers to what's going to, uh, you know, what's the next level, what we're going to do, what you know, what the impacts are it's going to take. But I know it's kill- it's killing our, you know, the trapping. And uh, the waterfowl that we used to have is not there anymore. You know, it's changing routes. The climate change is changing as well. There's so much in effect that you know, at all at once. But uh, but like I said, you know, as you watch your you know your territory coming, you know, to an end. You know, when the beautiful delta, the largest inland delta in the world, you know, is is in trouble. How do you fix that? There's, it's it's a question mark for me that I've always had, you know, since growing up as a kid until still today. It's uh, it's there's no I don't know what to say. I don't know what uh, impact it's going to give us, but there's a lot of impacts. It's we're already impacted big time, and so from here, I know that's something that we we need to discuss in our in our three to five territory. Yeah, it's a scary question mark to to be faced with. John Pomeroy, I'm wondering if you can uh, speak to this, the situation in in Cumberland House, and this might be a good time to just explain how that snow melt in the mountains in Alberta and and how it connects to uh, water here in Saskatchewan. Yes, uh, you know, Cumberland House has a profound connection to to the hydrology of the Canadian Rockies. Uh, Back in the uh, flood of 2013, Cumberland House had to evacuate before Calgary did. because of the uh, connection, and the connection is through the Saskatchewan River system. And uh, so also then when Alberta suffers from drought, uh, Cumberland House suffers from drought. Um, but it's also managed water moving through the system. And so there are a number of hydroelectric uh, dams on the uh, uh, Saskatchewan River system, and uh, and then also uh, Lake Diefenbaker, and of course the dams upstream in Alberta. And so the uh, for irrigation, they withdraw water, as a result, over the last century, the inflows uh, to the uh, uh, Saskatchewan River Delta have dropped about 30%. And uh, so some of that's maybe dropping snowpacks in the mountains, but a lot of that's water use and consumption of water not being returned to the river. And then, of course, we, we've had a multi-year drought uh, in the headwaters area and uh, very, very severe last year with the lowest flows ever recorded on the Bull River. Uh, back in Calgary, and uh, snowpacks had melted uh, five weeks earlier than uh, they would normally melt, and that uh, that caused drought throughout the system and low flows throughout the system. So Lake Diefenbaker only received 28% of its normal inflows in uh, 2023, and this passes on downstream, and uh, and uh, and of course Cumberland House is downstream of everyone else, and so uh, the uh, the nature, the hydrological nature of that big flat delta is it fluctuates widely. With these uh, water level fluctuations, uh, I'm very sorry that is occurring to you right now, but it is also long term because of the effect of the hydroelectric dams, the restriction of sediment supply to the delta, uh, essentially kills these natural ecosystems, and uh, and these are things we can manage. Uh, the deltas need deltas need to be flooded, they need sediment, and um, and of course with uh, with dams, uh, 
it's possible to restore some of that natural functioning uh, into the Delta. And I think it's something that should be taken very seriously in how we manage water in the province. Okay. Uh, Barry Carrier, I appreciate you calling today and giving us a glimpse into what you're facing in Cumberland House. And we'll, we'll, uh, we'll continue to stay in touch with you. So thank you for this today. Yeah, thank you very much. Let's go to Jeremy Welter next, the director of the board of the Agricultural Producers Association of Saskatchewan. He's also a farmer in West Central Saskatchewan near Corrobert. We're talking about people's concern uh, regarding drought. And so, Jeremy Welter, welcome to Blue Sky. Hi, thanks for having me. What are you seeing in your area? So, I mean, I am certainly noticing that, um, you know, things are things are obviously dry. And, and that's really nothing new. It's, uh, it's, it's been... You know, situation that we've dealt with over uh, over the last three years. Um, I'm sure a lot of your listeners uh, will remember. 21 was uh, was a devastating drought uh, across you know the vast majority of of, of Western Canada and and really uh, you know um, a large portion of, of North America. There was uh, there was a lot of cropland that was that was really devastated by a combination of drought and uh, extreme heat. Uh, and it's just something that we have uh, continued to uh, to deal with in uh, in the last three years. It's sort of hard to imagine that things could be even worse. Is that is that what you're hearing from from other agricultural producers? Or what, what's what what kind of speculating are, are people doing right now? You know, I don't think there's really a lot of um, speculating going on. I you know, I, it's it's. It's really a topic of uh, conversation that dominates, um, you know, a lot of uh, a lot of gatherings. Um, you know, me and, and and of course the other eleven directors at, at APAS, we we talk about drought and crop conditions uh, as as obviously as one of the challenges that uh, that we face in agriculture. But it's, uh, it 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 is a little bit more um, regional in the last couple of years. You know, twenty one was was significant and widespread. Uh, 22, there were there were definitely uh, you know significant pockets of it, but there was also pockets of uh, of average or or even uh, in some areas um, above average moisture. Um, where where we farm in West Central Saskatchewan around Crawford, uh, we've had you know really three uh, abnormally dry years. Even 22 was was drier than average as far as uh, as far as rainfall throughout the growing season. Um, and, and really the biggest concern is what it does is, uh, is, is, is it impacts the economics of farming. You know, you, you can make all the right decisions and do all the right things, you know, the, the, the right time for planting, the right time for, uh, for nutrient management or, or fertilizing. Um, but the ultimate decision uh, as to what happens on your farm in, in the long term is, is, is always going to come down to uh, moisture or lack thereof. So what about the planning, though, that goes into this? Does the dry weather change the way you plan for what kind of crops to grow? Oh, I, I think it absolutely does. You know, there's, there's really uh, nothing that will grow in, uh, in, an, in, an, in an absolute drought and a complete lack of moisture. Uh, you know, it, you look at what we're seeing for, for weather patterns, and, and my suspicion is that the, um, the economics of, say, something like canola, uh, your cost of seed, your cost of fertilizer, the, the current price of, of, uh, of the commodity, um, in a drought scenario, I, I think it definitely changes uh, what some people's planting intentions are. And so, like, are, are you hearing that from farmers who are looking for more drought-resistant crops? I mean, what would be a better, what would be an alternative? Cereals, pulses are generally a better alternative because they can be planted a little bit deeper. So you do have that option of planting into moisture, whereas canola is uh, is a fairly shallow. Uh, shallow depth plant to uh, to get started, obviously because of the small seed size. Hmm. I haven't heard anything uh, per se yet, but I'm I'm, I'm sure most people, uh, much like myself, are are, are watching uh, moisture conditions, you know, very closely. Um, it's not abnormal to get, uh, you know. A good dump of snow in March that uh, that can certainly get things off to a good start. Um, you know, substantial April rains could absolutely change things. It's it's 
you know, it's kind of the one constant that we joke about in Saskatchewan. If you don't like the weather, wait five minutes and it'll change. <laughs> it's true. And I actually want, I want to put that question to, to John Pomeroy, our guest today, professor at the University of Saskatchewan and Canada Research Chair in Water Resources and Climate Change. You know, at the start of winter, I think we were, were, we were waiting, like, okay, winter will come. We live in Saskatchewan. Like, just wait, just wait. January got really cold, got some snow. Is, is there still hope, John, that we, that we could either get another dump of snow or at least some spring? rain oh yes uh, there's always hope we've never lost a crop in february so um, <laughs> true <laughs> it's, uh, yeah it's, so the, and even the freezing rains that have come lately it's still rain mm-hmm. and um even though it's a bit weird and strange to have it in february uh but, but that will add uh, moisture to the soil um the, the thing is that there there are a number of things that can be done to uh, fight drought in the areas like Robert and west central saskatchewan this is where we had a lot of studies on this uh the, uh, by leaving tall standing stubble, by um, by in some cases of soils don't crack naturally by subsoiling them, so the cracks can stay there for about five years and get the moisture down to depth. Uh, the other is um, is leaving residue or trash on the fields between uh, the end of snowmelt and the start of seeding uh, to cut down on the evaporation losses out of the soil. And these can have a tremendous impact. And you know, if we were to get a good snow this winter in a drought year. Uh, studies have shown in those years uh, over half the crop yield can be actually created by the snowmelt water that entered the soil that fed by that and so that uh, so managing that snow is still one of the best things a farmer uh, can do uh, it's inexpensive it doesn't require irrigation machinery and uh, you can get more water in your field but uh, and, and of course in severe, sometimes we don't have a snowpack but many years we do Last year was a good example. This just proves that that you two are the experts, definitely not me, because, Jeremy, I I am hearing a little bit more optimism from you that uh, city folks are walking around just feeling like dread and doom and gloom, looking around that there's just no snow in the city. Um, And so I guess, you know, one final question for you, Jeremy. What do you need to feel good going into this growing season? Uh, You know, I mean, time is is ultimately, um, I I guess, the deciding factor. You know, uh, John made a great point. Nobody's ever lost a crop in, in February. Um, you know, things can turn around in a hurry. We've seen it happen before. So I, I, I suppose the takeaway is, um, kind of generally speaking, I think farmers are, are sort of the eternal optimist. You know, things will be better tomorrow. Things will be better tomorrow. And, 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 and the typical farmer's credo is, you know, in, in, in September, October, if, uh, if, if the year didn't turn out in your favor, you know, most guys generally say, well, if, there's always next year, right? And and so I, you know, looking at what we're currently sitting at and and the potential that is out there, uh, you know, we've we've seen uh, some very very significant crops and 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 really quick turnaround times in terms of uh, of snow and and, and rain. Um, you know, there's there's always uh, an incredible uh, possibility just based on uh, you know based on a, 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 a timely rain makes, makes okay. all the difference. So, well, yeah. I am I'm holding on to that, Jeremy Walter. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks. It's Jeremy Walter, a farmer in West Central Saskatchewan near Carrobert. We're also joined by John Pomeroy today, professor at the University of Saskatchewan and the Canada Research Chair in Water Resources and Climate Change. Let's go to Aaron in Landenberg, who joins us right now. Hi, Aaron. Hi, how are you? I'm well, thanks. What's on your mind? <clears throat> I'm just uh, thankful John's on the uh, program talking about uh, moisture and drought situations in Saskatchewan. It's it's definitely something we've been all looking at. Like, I'm a farmer for 30 years, and, and like you said, nobody's lost a crop in February, but I, I beg to differ that we haven't even lost a crop all the way up to June uh, because when Mother Nature decides to give us some rain, it can, it can really uh, affect our bottom line. Uh, one thing I want to bring up is uh, I'm the chairperson of Saskatchewan Irrigation Projects Association, and and one thing is we advocate on irrigation in a responsible manner. And uh, what I'm finding is is there's usually some misconceptions that uh, irrigators are water wasters, and I just I just want to bring to the forefront that re- that that we're not water wasters. We actually utilize it to grow food, and and the biggest thing is is we find the that could, the environmental um, positives from it. You capture you capture more carbon with uh, having more robust crop, and uh, compared to a dry land crop in the summertime, especially in the in the drought, 
um, there's more bio filter there. There's more mm-hmm. massive. So it actually filters the water and prevents soil erosion and wind erosion and stuff. So there's lots of positives. Okay. And the biggest thing is, one one other thing is, is it, pre- it prevents um, our tax dollars going and paying crop insurance payouts because uh, you're essentially drought-proofing your farm. So there's lots of positives as well. And we're, you know, we're locating water on the plains that can evaporate and uh, create more rain to fall down in other places. So hopefully it's a positive as well. All right. Well, I appreciate you bringing that up, Aaron. Thank you. It's Aaron in no Land. Yeah, Aaron in Langenberg. John Pomeroy, I'll, get, I'll just uh, get your thoughts on that. Um, yes. I mean, the, uh, in terms of crop production, there are tremendous benefits from irrigation. You can argue that human civilization itself started as uh, human societies adapted in the uh, Mesopotamia and parts of China and elsewhere uh, in the Americas to uh, dry conditions. And they did this by uh, uh, irrigating uh, to provide reliable crops. And that's really the start of uh, advanced civilizations. So uh, we've got a long history of doing this as a species and um, and we, uh, and also, I think we're very much aware of the challenges associated with it. it the advantage of irrigation is that you can go to the hotter, drier parts of a uh, uh, region uh, where if you had water, you would get great crops and then apply the water to get those crops. Um, and so that was, the, uh, that was the rationale behind the development of the South Saskatchewan uh, project back in the 1950s and the building into the 1960s is like De- what we know as Lake Diefenbaker. Hmm. I want to um, ask, actually ask you about something, the proposed Diefenbaker e- irrigation project, and, I, and then I want to move to to the risk of, of fires. So I don't know if this is a 30-second uh, answer for, to a question, but I'll, I'll still pose it and we'll then we'll move on to fire stuff. Robert emails, what might the impact of current weather patterns on the viability of the proposed Diefenbaker irrigation project? So the impact of current weather patterns on the viability of that. Yes. Um, so the uh, what we saw in 2023 were very low inflows into Lake Diefenbaker. Um, however, the uh, it's interesting to watch that the uh, reservoir levels have now approached normal conditions. And so there was a recovery from that was possible. It's a very big, very deep reservoir. And so we can take a short drought like we had in 2023. Uh, the question is always, how long is that drought going to be? Is it going to be five years or three years or two years? We don't know that yet. Okay. Let's move over to the risk that uh, people are concerned about when it comes to fires. So Dan sent us an email. I live up in Mississippi. Low water is disconcerting, but our real concern is forest fires. The land is bone dry right now. Snow is nice, but for us, the most critical moisture is spring rain. Once the land is thawed, the rain can soak into the muskegs and put out the 2023 fires that are still smoldering right now deep below the surface. If we don't get that rain, there will be many fires that will jump to the surface and keep going. Our 2023 summer and then fall was dry to the point that soil was burning under fire pits and then starting forest fires. In September, we all needed to dump water into fire pits before lighting campfires or refrain from open fires. When people didn't do this, locals had to put out root small forest fires. This touches on provincial forest fire fighting policies, which definitely need reviewing before this next summer of fires. So that's from Dan, who lives up in Mississippi. Before we put some of these questions to you, John, about how to prepare Uh, or just what to expect this upcoming season. I want to share a conversation that my colleague Peter Mills, who's the host of After the Afternoon Edition, had with uh, Prince Albert Grand Council because they've been expressing concerns about this upcoming fire season. So Cliff Bittner is the Grand Council's Director of Forestry and Emergency Protective Services. Here's the conversation. Uh, In my background, uh, fighting fire provincially since 1980, uh, I've seen a lot of change and I assume directly related to climate change and how we adapt to that uh, is paramount. Um, We want to be proactive rather than reactive. And from the work that I do and looking at the fire weather index at the end of the fire season last year, where there was a a very, very uh, extreme drought conditions uh, in deep moisture content, and, and we're looking at fuel moisture content. That and the current winter precipitation or lack of winter precipitation uh, makes me nervous uh, anticipating uh, uh, an extreme fire season again. Yeah. Cliff, you've been doing this for a while. Have, have you seen anything like this year? 
Uh, we've had recent years, uh, 2015, where, you know, 2015, 2017, uh, 20, 2007, and it, it seems to be a cycle over a period of time. But to me, it's it's the extreme lack of fuel moisture uh, that we had going into the winter, and that is going to be reflected in spring if we don't get any uh, early winter or overwinter or early spring precipitation. Now, tell me what you've seen where you are. Um, if I look down south in some of the grassland areas where, you know, we have temperatures of 17 degrees already, and the drought codes, the deep moisture content or fuel moisture deep in the ground uh, is more than twice as what would be considered extreme. So there are pockets in the southwest part of the province and the northeast part of the province where the ground moisture content is very low and without an overwinter resupply of moisture or spring rain, we're going to be in a very dry condition at the start of the fire season. Yeah, and how significant is that? It's it's more significant probably as we warm up further into the summer. Uh, before leaf out in the spring and May, there's no fuel moisture. So even deciduous forest or whatever is going to burn uh, as well as coniferous forest. Uh, for us, the biggest issue that we have right now is the source of ignition. So if there's a, a promotion or a communication or media, uh, I, I, something to identify the the um, prevention. How do we prevent human caused fires? And those are going to be the most significant at the start of the season before we have higher temperatures where we have cumulus buildup and potential for lightning, which the majority of the fires are started by lightning. Normally not earlier in May, but later into the summer. Uh, we think that industry and um, human-caused fires are going to be our biggest concern at the start of the fire season. Yeah. Are, are there particular areas where you think that's the biggest threat? I don't think it's it's any one particular area. It's the fuel moisture and the amount of fuel loading that you have will affect how extreme the fires are going to be. What 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 were the issues in 2023? What did you see? Uh, extreme fire behavior. Uh, we plan and, and train and qualify people to suppress fires. There are limitations to what you can do under extreme fire conditions because you cannot directly suppress the fire. It's too dangerous. You can't put people in front. One of the issues that we ran into in 2013 was the amount of smoke in the air. And every agency is affected by the amount of smoke in the air and their ability to action fires. If you can't fly, if you can't see and it's too smoky, it it severely restricts and it, it kind of, you know, people will question the, the agencies that respond to the fires, but if their hands are tied and they can't fly, it's too smoky because we're getting smoke from other jurisdictions coming into the province. Um, we're basically at the mercy of the weather. Yeah, you know, there's a couple of things I want to ask based on that, Cliff. You, just how prepared is the province to address what could be a very bad wildfire year? The province can address it in, in several ways if they start the fire season earlier. Generally, we start April 1st. Under our service contracts for sustained action fire personnel, we have to be fire ready by April 15th. So we have to go to every community, do the fitness testing requirements for that certification, so the communities can do their crew selections and train and be fire ready by the 15th of April when our contracts start. Is there enough money, enough workers to do this? Uh, we have contracts which are cost shared between the federal and provincial government, between the Public Safety Agency and Indigenous Services Canada, which is uh, one of a kind nationally. I don't think any other jurisdictions have it. When it comes to equipment, uh, when resources are exhausted across the western provinces or across Canada, through the Canadian, Canadian Interagency Forest Fire Centre in Winnipeg, resources are moved across the province as required. If other agencies have exhausted all the equipment that they have, and the provincial government has exhausted all the equipment that they have, we are supported through Indigenous Services Canada to provide or access equipment that we have available in the communities when we need it uh, and we have fires uh, adjacent or near the communities that we have to suppress. Is there anything more you'd like to see, see done? Um, for me, the biggest thing is is education, 
prevention, mitigation. Uh, we're currently doing mitigation work on uh, villages and recreational subdivisions that are uh, done through the Saskatchewan Public Safety Agency. Indigenous Services Canada also supports us to do on-reserve mitigation activities under the Emergency Management Assistance Program. Cliff, you know, one of the things when you're talking about the smoke in the air that, that really uh, made me think was, you know, most of this province, particularly I'm talking about south of you, would only see the smoke in the air. We hear about the wildfires, but they don't see them. They're not the communities that are being forced to evacuate. I'm curious, just what, what have you seen in terms of the devastating effects of wildfires? Under under the, you know, I guess with climate change, um, we see more extreme events. And under those extreme events, um, what options do we have? So if we can educate people, uh, prevent fires, do any mitigation work adjacent to the community, or uh, to try to keep people in the community without forcing them to be evacuated. In a lot of areas, it's it's the effect of smoke and not so much the direct threat of fire. Um, and how do we protect uh, vulnerable people within the community? So. We've we've established uh, uh, air scrubbers and, and re- respite areas within the community supported through Indigenous Services Canada on reserve uh, activities that we do uh, and and to support and, and protect our, our First Nation communities. Well, Cliff, thanks so much for doing this. I appreciate it. Cliff Bittner, the Director of Forestry and Emergency Protective Services for Prince Albert Grand Council, speaking with Afternoon Edition host Peter Mills. Our guest today on Blue Sky is John Pomeroy, Professor at the University of Saskatchewan and the Canada Research Chair in Water Resources and Climate Change. John, you've been listening. I'm wondering what your thoughts are and just overall what your sense is of 2024. I'm having flashbacks of what the season was like in 2023. And so what are we expecting this spring and summer? Yes, well, the uh, uh, problem we have right now is that there's low soil moisture that vast swells the province. Uh, the uh, north central part of the uh, prairie region, in particular the west central area, is extremely low. These are areas with less than half of the normal soil moisture, but also the north. And there's areas in northern Saskatchewan with estimates of less than 40% of the normal soil moisture right now. So that means that they're extremely uh, uh, vulnerable for fire as well as drought, uh, agricultural drought, and, uh, and of course, that fire risk uh, goes up as uh, soils dry. The low snowpacks in some places are also a big risk. The uh, shallower snowpack will melt earlier, and, uh, and of course, it's uh, will have less water to replenish soil moisture and uh, wetlands and uh, stream flows. So, the, uh, so that's a risk as well, and there's a strong tie-in between low snow years and the big fire years like uh, back in uh, 20, uh, 2015. Yeah. So we got an email from Jen who writes, how does frozen ground affect the land's ability to absorb melting snow snow moisture? Would it all just be running off or will it still be absorbed into the ground eventually? I thought in spring moisture absorbs into soil well, but what about during these melts midwinter? Because it does feel more like March or April right now than it does February. So what's what's going on, John? Yeah, that's a great question, Jen. Uh, the uh, Saskatchewan's got seasonally frozen soils. The soils typically freeze down a couple of meters. And uh, so there's uh, ice as well as liquid water in those soils, and they're fully frozen. And then there's uh, air-filled pore space. So as long as the soils are not saturated and frozen, uh, then generally uh, meltwater or winter rains can percolate into that frozen brown. But it doesn't percolate in as readily as rain would in the unfrozen soils say in May or June or July. Uh, so it's much slower, uh, but it does uh, often can make its way through. The, the risk is, though, if you get a, uh, a midwinter melt or midwinter rain, just like we've had, you can often cap those soils with an ice layer. Uh, it can be in the dirt itself or just above it, and that prevents uh, subsequent uh, moisture from entering the soil when snow melt occurs, and it causes very flashy uh, runoff conditions. I, I think swift current had this uh, last spring. They had flooding in the midst of a drought. And, uh, right, uh, the, that's uh, right. And we were all like, what's going yeah. on? <laughs> oh. Yeah, yeah, and it's these ice layers. And so we have to deal with that. Um, one way farmers can uh, help um, uh, get water into frozen ground is subsoiling, uh, deep tillage to uh, 
put cracks in the soil. The other is through conservation agriculture, minimum tillage. So let leave them alone, let them crack, and uh, get the water into the frozen soils through the cracks. Hmm. Um, but uh, otherwise, it's a challenge, and uh, you know the prairies have it, and not many other parts of the world can help us with solving them. So we, we tend to sort out our solutions ourselves. Okay, I'm going to throw in one more question just quickly here from Robert. How do current precipitation patterns compare to what was experienced in the 1930s? Uh, was the drought province-wide in the 1930s? We don't seem to hear stories of smoky days due to forest fires like we have had in recent summers. So I'm going to give you 30 seconds for a bit of a history lesson, John. Sorry about not giving you much time, but what's your response to that? Okay, uh, the, the 1930s droughts spread over a number of years and they were patchy. And they stayed in the uh, southern part of the province. Uh, so a lot of farmers went north into the Peace River country or even in the parklands to get away from the really dry conditions in the far south. Also, farming practices were not nearly as well developed as they are now. Hmm. And uh, we've had worse droughts in the 1930s recently and got through them reasonably well um, because we've uh, uh, dropped summer following and a lot of other uh, practices that uh, were harmful at that time. Interesting. John, it's been great having you today. We didn't get to all the emails and questions because we just ran out of time, but clearly this is top of mind for a lot of people. So I appreciate you being our expert today here on Blue Sky. So thank you. Okay, well, thank you for having me on.